Hello, this is the RPG Pundit, the final boss in Internet Shitlords, and that's my cat, <laughs> who's gotten right into the shot right away as I began this video. I guess that's okay. Now, some of you might be wondering, as soon as you uh, saw the title, is this an ad? Have I clicked on an ad? And the short answer is basically uh, no. No, what you've clicked on is something in some ways worse. It's an opportunity for me to show off. You know, the other day I was running my, my DCC game and I had someone come up to me with a copy of, of Lion and Dragon. Um, a gamer came up to me with a copy of Lion and Dragon, asked me to sign it, said it was the best game system he'd ever read. He just loved it. He wanted me to sign it. So I signed it, of course. And he said, I know that this might cause your head to swell. And I said, is it, first I said, is it possible that it could swell any, any bigger than it already is? And second, I said, well, you know, you've just said basically that I am like unto a god. <laughs> so I do very much think that, uh, you know, whatever, there are many things that people have said about me that are, that are lies, right? A lot of um, false accusations placed against me by different people, mostly SJWs. But one thing that I think would be a legitimate thing you could say is you could certainly never accuse me of having an excess of humility. So this is not really an ad. This is the fact that I've just finally gotten my author's copy of The Old School Companion, The Medieval Authentic Old School Companion, and I really want to show it off to you because I'm very proud of it. I'm very happy with how it turned out. I'm happy also with how Presses Intermedia handled the the um, the quality of the of the of the production it was the last thing that they were doing before um, before Spectre Press became my my publisher and it's just fantastic it's it's a really really lovely tome so I wanted to give you guys an idea of what's in it um, and and what it's about but so you know like you know what I'm proud of okay <laughs> so if you if you decide to buy this because of this video. Well, great. But that's not my first goal. My first goal is basically to show off something that I'm really pleased with. And, and, and it's the type of pleasure that I think you can't really understand unless you have published a book. You know, it's a pleasure that incredibly I feel every time a book I wrote is published, because there's been a lot of them by now. And you'd think that that would just become something that would feel more normal, but it doesn't. And I think maybe if you haven't written a book, then maybe like the closest thing to that, which I think would be different, but also, you know, maybe in some ways deeper, but maybe in other ways um, more, not not quite the same, would be having a child. You know, because this is, this is a little bit of immortality that I'm holding in my hand, right? Um, so the Old School Companion is a project of a compilation of the medieval authentic material from the first half of the RPG Pundit Presents series. So from issues 1 to 50. It's all the medieval authentic stuff except the adventures. Those will eventually be in a separate um, compilation volume. And so it's not the adventures, it's not the gonzo stuff, it's just all everything else, the medieval authentic stuff. And it's been put together in a handy way, in a way that makes it very organized. So you might be saying, well, I, you know, I've got a couple of the Pundit Presents stuff, so why would I need... Why would I need another one, right? And and um, and the answer is is that it's it's going to be done for easier reference. And of course, I mean, if you've gotten every single pun it presents, and then, then you're not going to get any new material here. So you might, you know, if you were getting it, you'd be getting it either just because you wanted to to support my work that I that I do here on YouTube, or because you really wanted a print version because this is the first time you can get it, you know, legally in a print version. Um, but if, if you only bought like one or two, then you're going to find a ton of other stuff here that you're probably going to find worthwhile. So this first collection, it, it divides the product not by issue order, how it was before or something like that. Instead, it divides it all into sections that are of similar subject. Uh, first, you get some note about, you know, how to do most DC checks here. Because this book, first of all, I should, I should note, this is a source book. It's not an RPG. And it's a source book that you can use directly with Lion and Dragon. You can use pretty much directly with any OSR RPG. Like, the, the, it would, there would be a 1% amount of conversion that you might have to do 
for pretty much any OSR or D&D based rule set because there, there's most of the material here you can immediately just plug and play it into whatever OSR or D&D based rule set you've been, you've been using. And of course it might need a little bit more conversion if you're using some kind of non-OSR, non-D&D based game. But there'd still be a lot of material here that you could probably use quite directly because some of the material is, is like reference material. So the very first section, you get some character classes, and these character classes are made mostly for like NPC classes, but they could be character for like PC classes in campaigns that were very kind of low power and more like intrigue based or things like that. Craftsman, the Archer, the Sage. Uh, the Archer is the only one that could directly be a PC class in, in any context. Some information alongside the Archer on longbows and crossbows. And then we go to the advanced critical tables. Now, if you own Lion and Dragon, you know that there's a critical table there that's a fairly anatomically detailed critical table. Um, this expands that into specific critical tables by weapon type. And the injuries are meant to be, you know, pretty reflective of like a, a kind of, no, I, I hate saying the word realism, but we'll say verisimilitude. Um, of the type of injury that, like, the, the type of effects that an injury with a spe that specific type of weapon, piercing, slashing, blunt, etc., would cause in a particular location. Um, arrows and bolts, animals and monsters. Uh, I think I missed one there somewhere, but anyways, you get, you get the bullets, I think, was the one that was missed, and some other details. Next, we get into the section on, uh-oh, here's the other one. It's big chungus. <laughs> there's a there's a chunk of sighting. Look at this. It takes up the entire camera space. <laughs> All right. So domain management and mass combat. This material, if you own line, uh, if you own Dark Albion, the Dark Albion setting book, I included it there because it was something uh, that I thought would be important for that campaign book. And it's being reproduced here with some uh, slight additions and modifications. And um, it it's basically a very simple system for handling dominions, domains, whatever you want to call it, nations, uh, you know, uh, well, I guess they'd be really small nations, uh, more like earldoms or things like that, that's maybe what I was thinking of, or um, family territories or things like, like that sort of stuff. And it has a mass combat system that is, uh, there's actually, technically there's two combat resolution systems here. One is a fairly simple, very abstract sort of mass combat system because I hate really deep, like if you're gonna do a really detailed mass combat system, you might as well just play a war game, right? So one is a fairly simple, and the other one is an unbelievably simple one. So it's just a random table of stuff that could happen to you with a few mechanics of how to handle it when, you're, when, you, when you as the DM don't really need the battle as a whole to be resolved. You just wanna resolve how it went for the players in a battle. So that's, that's those two. Next we get to, I think is probably the juiciest chapter of all, which is Spellbooks and Grimoires. One of the things that differentiates uh, Lion and Dragon from most other D&D based games is that it doesn't use Vancey and spellcasting and the magic is totally different. The magic in Lion and Dragon is based off of real medieval magic, like how the medieval people understood magic to work, what it was like. And so, what are you looking at? <laughs> and so they're, they're, um, uh, the magic is largely based off things like grimoires and stuff like that. It's a very different way of handling a magician and here, what I've got is more material for that. So I have, first of all, a section on advancing wizard spellbooks, which would be something you could use to help um, if you don't want to use just the, the, um, the Lion and Dragon magic system, or if you're playing in a different game than Lion and Dragon, how you can make a spellbook for a wizard in that system act more like a magical diary would have acted for a medieval magician. Then we get into the grimoires, the Goetia, which is well, probably one of the most famous grimoires. That one covers quite a lot of space there with a large list of, of different um, demons. Uh, the Gayad al Akim, the Clavicula. And so each one of these are books that you could have a Magister find. And you can see how you could just completely plug it and play it into any, um, any magical system that you're using. I mean, you could be playing fifth edition and have the, you know, a magician will find this book, they can study this book, they can learn this magic as well as the magic that they're already doing. Um, so, so it's not uh, very difficult at all to incorporate. 
the Theurgia, lots of spirit stuff, the Book of Quaternary Tables, the Book of New Arts. So these are a whole bunch. There were a whole bunch of Pundit Present series that were like a, a, a real or a, or a book really inspired by a real medieval grimoire, the Book of the Arts of Hours, that describes the type of magical effects that they were supposed to have. Um, and then you have Astrology. This is an expansion on the very basic astrology rules you had in Lion and Dragon. And basically, this is how medieval astrologers did astrology, which is totally different than how people do astrology in the modern world, where astrology was being done in the medieval period, not really as a kind of character reading, like, oh, you're a Gemini, so that means you're talkative. You know, that, that was not what the point was of astrology back then. And so you have astrology that, can, that, that an astrologer character can use astrology to try to determine specific time periods that will give bonuses or that could cause penalties to taking certain types of action, be it, you know, combat, public speaking, or things like that, um, to set auspicious dates. Uh, and to use astrology for potions and for medicine. And then the Arcana is looking at the Tarot, which does have a section on how to use the Tarot for divination, but the main point of the Tarot was not divination in the early, you know, in the, in the late medieval and early Renaissance. The, the, the Tarot was a system of training in, um, in symbols, right? And, and, I mean, there's some debate about whether the Tarot in the Renaissance was even being used as... A magical device or not. I think it was. A, there are some very good academics that think it wasn't. Um, but the point is that, that this is how it would have been used anyways, because if it wasn't the tarot, there were other things that were being used in exactly the same way, which are basically the um, symbolic art pieces that were meant to both be used for training people in understanding like astrology or, or alchemy um, and at the same time that were used to create like trance-like effects if you if you looked into them that would cause you to be able to have you know kind of these astral trips so this is like you're using the terrier as gateways to other realms um, it's all very cool stuff after we're done the grimoires we get to the an entire section which is the history and rule of the clerical order so and you know if you've played lion and dragon or dark albion the clerics are like an order of holy warrior knights they're the only ones that have divine magic, a regular priest doesn't, um, and they have a very strict rule and order. They're incredibly respected in medieval society, but um, they're, they're not uh, as free as other people to do whatever they like. They have to follow this very strict militant rule, sort of like clerics in Lion and Dragon are a lot closer to what paladins would be in some other, you know, D&D type setting. So I've made a constitution of how the clerics have to behave and what they have to do and all kinds of rules about how they operate for, uh, it's basically like deep setting fluff, but stuff that would basically affect, directly affect the life of, um, a, of, of a person playing a cleric in the campaign. Um, and this could be used also for, you know, to for a paladin in, in a different type of game, or for an order of knights. In fact, this is based in part on the constitution of the Templar Knights, which were kind of the inspiration for the clerical order in, in Dark Albion. Um, here we have some activities for players in the medieval world, including what happens if you're homeless in the medieval world, how you can handle small land ownership, mercenary work, all stuff, becoming a magister in the collegium, um, stuff that is all based on authentic medieval elements, right? And then merchants and caravans. So if you're a merchant going over land, trying to sell goods, what is that like? Um, so lots of stuff that is really interesting, which you could use in part or in whole to deepen the, um, level of medieval authenticity of your game with lots of exciting things happening along the way, of course, because there's all kinds of like potential encounters you can have on the roads. There's, you could become an owler, uh, which is a, a, a medieval term. If you want to know what it is, you'll probably have to buy the book. Um, and uh, the court of pie powders, which is like uh, in market days, this, this crazy court that has to handle whatever disputes come up at the time of, of, the, of the market. Um, then you have courtly events and intrigues, which is a set of like small adventure seeds slash events that uh, can happen at a noble or royal court. So a bunch of adventure seeds for you. 
Then you get to the Twilight Realm of the Fae, another section I think will be very, very appealing to some people, which covers basically a medieval authentic look at what the, the plane of the fairies or the, the elves uh, would be like in the medieval world, how the medieval people imagined the land of fairy creatures to be, um, the, the other side, right, the place beyond that, that veil uh, of the land of men. And uh, it has... Um, it's basically extra planar adventuring, but done super medieval style, <laughs> okay? And uh, you get uh, how you can get to Fairyland, what you do in it, um, different encounters that you can have, uh, the different areas of the Fey Realms, uh, creatures with, uh, you know, statted out and everything, and what happens to return. Then you get a section on cursed artifacts. So these are some artifacts that are based, in some cases, on real medieval folklore, or uh, legends, or stories, or things like, uh, you know, along those lines, or uh, in a couple of cases, like actual objects that really existed, that were said to be cursed. And so these are different objects that are, that all of them have some kind of power that has like some probably real value for the person that gets it. And so there's a great temptation to use it, but they also all come with terrible consequences if you do. So <laughs> it'll be the sort of cursed items that I like. I've always liked, I hate cursed items that are just like you grab this and now you have minus one to hit forever. That's that's stupid. What you want is, is something that the player character will have to really debate, or the player themselves will have to really debate if their character will want to let go of the item. The, the worst cursed item is a cursed item that you're forced to keep. Um, the cursed item that, that you... you you become addicted to for real is the one that that really is awesome and then you have a set of supernatural encounters which are also all based on real medieval folklore real medieval stories and legends uh literature and myth um so uh, mostly from england but uh, with a couple of other stuff and uh you know encounters that you can have that are potentially quite exciting to add medieval elements to your game and yes, you saw there the, the fairy ostrich. There's a fairy ostrich you could face. Um, Fishmen. And, and this is pretty much the end of the product. So you get a whole bunch of material that you can add to your... I mean, obviously, if you play Lion and Dragon, this is a great product to have. It, it really expands, especially stuff like the magic sections, the, the world fluff, um, useful tables that you can have in all kinds of contexts. Uh, the critical system can totally be used in some in any OSR game. The magic in here can be used in any OSR game. Um, all the all the the setting stuff can very easily be used in almost any OSR type game. You just plug it into where it fits, right? So it's um, it's a product that has, I think, widespread appeal. <laughs> um, and it's yeah, it's the first of a few compilations that are going to come out. So there are going to be others. The next one will probably, I think, be the the, the first Gonzo Companion. But for now, I just wanted to share this. I, I, I'm really happy with how the book has turned out. Um, I mean, visually, I had nothing to do with that, but it's, it's uh, spectacular. I love this, this cover, which is taken from actual medieval art, of course. Um, and, and I wanted to show it to you because I'm proud of it. But also, if you decide that you are interested in picking it up, well, you'll, you'll see a link below and where you can buy it, of course. Uh, it's on the drive through RPG. And you can get it print on demand, I think. I think it's $29.95 for the PDF and the print version together. So um, that's probably the, the best deal. And, uh, you know, it's 266 pages. It's a lot of material. It's, it's, uh, it, I think it's a pretty, good, uh, a pretty good bargain. It's already become, I think, copper bestseller at this point uh, really quickly. It's doing quite well. So I guess that's it for today. If you like this video, please share it anywhere you want to. Anyone that you think will be interested in this book, share it anywhere that you think people would be interested in this book. Share this video and click on the link to subscribe. Um, click on the notification bell so you'll find out when I'm doing live streams and stuff like that. My last live stream was hugely successful. I'll probably do another live stream. I don't know if this weekend, I, I, I kind of hope I can, but I, I might not be able to. We're going to have to see. And... Um, Sharing the video is one of the best ways to help me, to help this channel to, to, to grow and to encourage me to keep doing this. And if, uh, if you want to just throw money at me, then by all means, uh, I have a PayPal and a Patreon page and you could definitely do that. But what I would recommend is you 
pick up my products like the old school companion or lion and dragon and if if medieval authentic isn't your thing then check out in the rpg pundit presents series um there's like 50 different source books that are weird fantasy uh space science fantasy gonzo sort of adventuring stuff that you might find more interesting and eventually there'll be some compilations of those uh that's everything for today goodbye from me and from the the chungus there she is <laughs> she really she literally blocks out the camera <laughs> currently smoking um this is a. Uh, Oh, damn. I've forgotten the name now. Not a Savinelli. Um, it's... Uh, Davidoff. That's it. It's a Davidoff 400 series with Argento Latakia. All right. Time to go.